That was my first con. That was my first American con, actually. That was like the week before Phonogram came out. Uh, and I got that suit for like le- about 100 quid. It was about 100 quid in, uh, from a local place that was slightly reduced. And it was one of those kind of like, okay, I'm going to a place, I'm going to be in character, uh, and I'll wear this suit. And of course, then Fraction turns up in the white suit, and, but Fraction's a very good looking man, so you can sort of pull it off. Whilst I look like I'm the bassist in like um, a ska band. So <laughs> it was a good time, though. Hey, there's nothing wrong with being a bass player. I have one right True. here. No, no, I'm, I'm also a bassist. That is a, like that's when I was in bands I played bass. Excellent, excellent. Um, I really wanted to talk to you today about Once and Future. Uh, the trade for that just came out. It's available. Um, I believe it, it. It's it's in bookstores now. It's available digitally, and I believe uh, several comic stores like also got it before the uh, Diamond Shutdown. I don't want to spoil the, who the villain is, but um, can you kind of tell us, like, you're feel, feel, feel free to spoil it since the first trade's out and the second arc's beginning, but uh, what was it like to basically twist this uh, English uh, legend that you probably grew up with, like, even more than I did here in North America, to basically twist it as much as you did? It was fun. I mean, it was, it's, it's a weird story because it's an, um, any writer generates too many ideas. This kind of ideas are cheap. That's the kind of, as anyone's actually sat around and play a role playing game knows, <laughs> you know, anyone can, gen- you can generate ideas very easily if you sit down and play. But I was playing one day and I just watched the, what, some of the old, the 90s and early 2000s mummy movies. And I was looking at them and I was just thinking, obviously these are really fun movies and, and I love Indiana Jones, but there's this big colonialist streak all the way through adventure fiction. Because, you know, the mummy is basically, let us take the founding fathers of Egypt and turn them into monsters. <laughs> and I was like, okay, that, that's a bit dodgy if you, if you think about it for a few seconds. And I was just thinking, like, okay, how could you do that? Uh, something that has all the fun bits of that genre and do it in a way which uh, makes it like more palatable or more palatable to, palatable to me anyway. And I thought, okay, you do it with like British stuff. So I, like, I'm going to do it with Arthurian mythos. So that was kind of the core thing. So taking all these Arthurian characters and do this dark, monstrous take on them. And I thought that, that's fun. Put it in a drawer, forgot about it. Uh, or, to be honest, I never quite forgot about it. You know, there's, there's ideas I've got in drawers that I'm, I, like the Ark of the Covenant, that they're just in that, that, that place and not to be touched. Well, that was always one I was like, okay, maybe if the right day came around. And then Boom uh, wrote to me saying that uh, Dan Mora was interested in doing a book with me. And I love Dan's work. And yeah. I just sort of flipped through my files. Oh, that Dan would do an amazing, monstrous horror comic. Uh, I wonder if he's interested. So he said yes, and the rest is history. So it's that kind of, that, it was like, that was the core novum, the idea of like doing an adventure fiction, but um, uh, with the colonialism like bled out a bit a little. Um, like you spoke about the mummy and kind of, uh, I don't believe the mummy screenwriters were Egyptian in, uh, by birth. But you're, for once in future, you're British, as, 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 as far as I can tell. Uh, <laughs> I like to basically have, a, I don't know if uh, the agency is the right word, to basically be able to twist your own mythology. Like, would you have the same, uh, like, I want to say rampant ability to twist it if it was of a culture that wasn't your own? I, must, I try to avoid doing that. Even with Whitdiv, like... Um... Because you're always doing a conversation on what you think is susceptible to do, and you always measure the cost versus the benefit. Um, uh, and for me, it's always the case of like, am I stomping over a story? Like, I did this book, Wicked and Divine, and Wicked and Divine was about gods and gods returning to earth, and they're all from pantheons all over the world. And part of it was knowing that the story was we're going to take from many pantheons because I want to make it a world book, it's not just a particularly Western book. At the same time, um, if you took a god that was too obscure or that was still being worshipped as a, as a living religion, um, you, um, you either risk you know, A, offending practitioners in that religion, or B, um, taking over in pop culture the idea. Because some of the gods, like there was, I, I, was, I loved the, um, the Yoruban gods. They're really interesting. They're, you know. However, the problem with Yoruban gods is they're not as well known in the world. So if I may take one of the Yoruban gods and make them very popular, uh, is that that's going to warp people's idea of what the Ruben you know belief system is? So that that, that would be a cost that's too much for me personally. <laughs> but you know, though everyone else measures them differently. In the case of like ones of future, um, 
Yeah, you are. I'm, I'm British, and it's a, the matter of Britain to quote the old history. <laughs> That's literally what yeah. you know. The, 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 the matter of Britain is, is is the histories we're talking about here, um, and the conversation of what Britain is is kind of what the book's about. Like my grand, like Bridget in the book, is Irish. Um, my other half of my family is Scottish. There's the other bits are English. So it's just kind of like I'm very aware of somebody who is in a conversation with his various parts of Celtic heritage. I'm also aware of like. Um, I mean, the thrust of the book, of course, is kind of about this, is how the idea of Britain has changed. Because, you know, mm. King, as the book goes into quite deeply, um, you know, King Arthur wasn't... We'd say King Arthur defended the Britons against invaders. And, of course, the invaders were the Anglo-Saxons, <laughs> you know? And this is one of the really interesting things about Arthur is how Arthur's been reinvented through the years. Like, he started as this Welsh folk hero. Then he, and there was various times in the history when he was a, a bit like a rebel leader figure. You know, like he was, it was kind of like the the Normans were trying to crunch, you know, push down on the Arthur kind of glorification because he was kind of like seen as a a, a, a figure of sedition. And then later, of course, uh, French uh, like a Rob Roy kind of. Yeah, yeah, exactly, a Rob Roy figure. That's a really good example. Um, and then, and then there was different periods. He became important to different people. So the French go into him, which of course is when Lancelot enters the stories. Like obviously the French start writing it and suddenly you've got Lancelot arriving in it because you've got this very cool French character. You know, it's a bit like, um, if, it's, to be honest, if you look historically, it's almost like the modern like corporations like Marvel and DC, as they expand the, the countries they publish in. Okay, we'll do a, cap we're publishing in Britain now, we'll do a Captain Britain. You know, it's kind of, that is kind of off, enough time stream off there. Of course, Arthur, you know, now we'd think of him as a, as a even an English figure, let alone a British figure. Uh, and various, but there's other times have been more or less popular. And in some ways, Want the Future is about looking at that and how the story is. I mean, like, in some ways, it's like, you know, people do the stories about, like, DC continuity. You know, like, how did Batman, or, you know, the Grant Morrison Batman thing. Um, mm -hmm. And for me, like, Want the Future is somehow a conversation of all these myths of Arthur talking to each other. And that kind of, okay, where did Galahad come from? When did, you know, what was this about? Why was this important then? And more importantly, what does it mean now? And of course, you know, the whole story becomes much more, um, there is a resonance to the story at the moment with Brexit, like, you know, before the current situation, like, you know, we came to this year thinking it was just going to be a Brexit year. That was going to be our disaster. I say showing my political stride quite strongly there. And it hasn't really turned out like that, which says a lot. Um, but, you know, the, Britain has always been a weird country in terms of like its conversation, ever since, the, especially since the British Empire. You know, it's weird, weird global footnote you know, in the larger scale of history. I mean, it's a footnote. Well, we did this thing in uh, Wicked Divine where we did 6,000 We did 6, years of culture in a single issue. We skipped forward 90 years every panel. So this was like ludicrous to research. But the main thing that taught me is like on the global scale, it's been China and Egypt for 4,000 years. <laughs> and like anything else, it's just been a really minor blip. <laughs> um, but obviously... The uh, the shadow and the uh, of those sort of more recent history is, is obviously much more noticeable now. I've answered all the questions, Chris. <laughs> I have a lot more. Like uh, like we could go on for several parts, but we'll see. Um, uh, you like you mentioned this idea of time, but also going back to something you mentioned about how the idea for something is different than actually writing the something. In this case, once in future. Do you felt, do you, like you said, you kind of had this I idea in a drawer for a while. Do you think you could have written this, um, say, five, seven years ago at all? Or would it be different? Or why? Oh, it would, yeah, sorry. Yeah, it would definitely be different. I mean, any idea, it always speaks. This is one of the things where, this is something me and Jamie, who we did obviously Wake Diff together, uh, and Phonogram and Young Ventures, is that we often talk about the idea of books. People try to make books timeless. And that never works because books always speak from the time. It's just your tiny choices of fashion, in wording, in panel construction. Like a mid noughties comic will always appear to be a mid noughties comic unless it's done as a retro piece. Um, so you're always going to speak to the moment. So yes, it would have been then. However, obviously Brexit changes some of the things. Um, but at the same time, as I said, Britain has been in conversation about what being British means for like about a thousand years at least. You know, like I think I, I think since the uh, but arguably, since the Anglo-Saxons arrived, my, if you had to basically make me bet something at 11.30 at night, <laughs> I would say, uh, since then, the conversation of what British means has been ongoing. So in other words, especially like anything post-Empire, it'd be very easy to do once in the future, I think. 
<laughs> um, but like, I think it's especially timely now, <laughs> for, like for the reasons I talked about earlier. Um, exactly. One of the things that uh, the ALA, uh, the Graphic Novel and Comics Roundtable, is promoting uh, this year, and since uh, since we've been founded, is the idea that comics are for everyone. Like I think, like, even though you and I may may have not been using those words back when we met in 2006, it's something I've seen in your work and something we've been kind of pushing. But kind of, how do you feel about? the openness of the idea of uh, comics are for like everyone and how for some it may be an argument kind of to validate it but kind of how do you feel about just that statement and just what it's trying to uh, uh just... it's like it's uh, i own i mean jody blair did the comics are for everyone t-shirts and you know I, I have that and you know everyone that year was wearing them i mean comics are for everyone are kind of like um i mean remember like so when we were I, when we were sort of coming in for 2006, when I got into comics in 2000, the idea was diversity in genre, as in the idea, there was definitely, that was the part of the conversation, the idea that comics don't have to just be superhero books, they could be other things as well. And like, I, I mean, the, the metaphor Warren Ellis used was, um, you know, if you walked into a, sh uh, into a bookshop and said, and so everything was a nurse novel, it would be weird. And that's kind of the idea. Um, uh, which, you know, that was the major talking point circuit then. And as, as this has gone, gone onwards, the industry has got better to think about like, diversity in its, all its forms. Because like comics are for everyone. It's actually saying two things simultaneously. It's simultaneously anyone can come and do comics. Comics is uh, not, uh, not a shut off part of the world. Comics is like a book. You know, books are for everyone. You know, movies are for everyone. These kind of, this is a, this is a, a wise speaking media thing. Um, and so this speaks to the welcoming, but it also means comics are for everyone. Means there is a comic for everyone. Is that's that's um, and that I think is more the um, uh, the, the goal. I think that's the thing, right? That just we might be getting close, but at the same time, that's the goal. That was always the thing. As in, I should be able to meet any of my friends or any of my friends' parents or any of my friends' children and grandparents and grandchildren and say, "Hey, what are you into?" They tell me, and I go, "Oh." This is, you should try this, you'll probably like it. And that's kind of what it means. What I think, um, I mean, talking on a personal level, there are some people, there are some that are, take the, where I kind of differ with the statement a little, is that the comics of everyone means that every comic should be for everyone. And that's what I kind of disagree with. I just think, yeah. I think a comic, the medium should be big enough to include something for everybody. Like, there's very much like, people can come to, oh, I want this. And that's fine, because that's such a small niche, and that's by deliberately a niche book. Um, uh, does that make sense? I mean, it's like one of my least favorite things in a reviewer ever says in a review, and I, I hated this when I was a critic. As I used to be a listeners, I used to be a critic as well back in the day. Um, this uh, this book isn't for everyone, or like not everyone's, and no one likes everything. <laughs> it's like na name one single piece of art in all history that people everyone likes. So it's one of those completely um, useless statements. But you know, um, it's not the everyone should like every comic is not like a statement. I think people make in good faith. Or people, or things people say, mm -hmm. if they thought about it much. I guess if that makes any sense. Yeah, like it's, like it's not as a value judgment, but it's just as a uh, each person has their own um, it, like interest. Because I'll say that there's comics out there that are definitely not for me. Mm. Not discounting or saying the quality's not good. It's just I don't know for just reasons that just what I come into it like it's just not. A good fit for me but that's perfectly okay and that's yeah. there's something i used to say i used to be a i remember 2007 to i used to be a games journalist and I, like that was one of the things i was a critic of um and i remember interviewing warren specter who was like the famous game developer did deus ex i said one of the many problems with video games is i like too many of them <laughs> by which i mean is if there were more video game types being made <laughs> I should not like some of more of them. Like most, I don't like most of the games, you know, but I can understand them and get them. And like, they have set, they're noticeably for me too much. And of course that's changed now. As in there is a wider variety of games now and there's more stuff I wouldn't play now, which is good because that's how art forms grow. Um, Speaking to comics are for everyone and just kind of different types of comics. Like um, I've, I've uh, followed your work from you and uh, Jamie doing comics for games, magazines, <laughs> doing so doing uh different kinds of uh, mythological comics uh you've done some great superhero comics um but is there 
a type or genre or comics that you haven't done that you would like to do? Like, would you like to do your own uh, version of UK's Dennis the Menace? Or is there like a sports comic you would like to do? Or That's what you have ideas. Uh, and so, you know, there's a lot of, and you, they sort of, you drill down and you play with them and you think, oh, that's good. Or oh, that's something you'd like to do someday. Um, I mean, there's, there's a crime comic idea I've wanted to do forever. But like, I distrust myself as a street level writer. Um, mm. I think um, it's set in the, um, like, do you know the Great Fog in London in 52? There was a, like, there's this big fog and about 10,000 people died. Uh, and, that, and that's why the clean air laws came in. Uh, and like 10,000 people get the, the weak and the underprivileged and people who, uh, and older people. And um, in fact, this, thick, this fog was so thick that you were in the cinema and you couldn't see the screen. You know what I mean? And it's at least one thing that interests me about the period is the fact that before that period, oh my God, this is, sorry, this is completely coronavirus, obviously, as well. But the idea is before that period, they said, oh, we can't do anything about this. And then the period happened. And we, we, the the, tri- the awfulness of the system in Britain was revealed, and afterwards they changed, you know, they changed the laws to make clean air. Like, and that for me, it was like, whilst this is obviously a very depressing period to set a crime, because the, the story would be about a crime happening there. Which, but what does crime matter in a situation like that bad? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um. So, you know, that's another, you know, so I'm talking for that idea. Um. Yeah, I mean, that's the sort of stuff I always kind of think about. My big problem, Chris, and this is embarrassing, is like, I'm sitting there thinking, oh, I'm, this is a sensitive grown-up story, you know, and they, you know, this is going to be real, you know, uh, crystalline character work, and this is going to really, uh, and then I stick a bloody wizard in it. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I'm just like, um, I'm sitting there, and I'm writing, I'm writing these, I'm thinking about this literary fiction stuff, and suddenly a wizard's there, doing wizard stuff. Um and the thing is, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm just a fantasy writer. That's the thing is, that at, at the sort of core, there's, uh, there's a sort of playfulness there, I guess. Mm-hmm. I mean, the thing I would probably, there's an alternate version of me, and it's the, um, more of the historical stuff. Like, imagine my career, if Free, was, as in my Spartan comic, Free was a big hit, and it was suddenly everyone's, oh, Kieran, do another, you know, do another comic about the Greeks. And, you know, I'll be happy there. And there's like, um, there's all sorts of historical stuff I would love to do. And to be honest, like if you look at the stuff I do do in comics, a lot of it is quite a lot of history in there as well. You know what I mean? Um, I mean, guess it's like I mean, ironically, Ludocrats is coming out would have been coming out this week, um, and that which is and Ludocrats is a comedy, and like there's a lot of funny stuff in my work, but Ludocrats is a full stop sex comedy and very silly, um, and that's uh, completely different to what most of the stuff people would be used to me. And there's um, sorry, there's a there's a do you know the oblique strategy cards the Alan, Alan Moore talks about all the time? Yes, yes, sir. Yeah. yeah. Alan, the, for the people who don't know who are listening, the oblique strategy cards are basically um, Brian Eno and another person whose name I never remember. It's a deck of cards, and if you ever, st- basically, you're feeling uninspired, you pick a card from the deck and you follow the instructions to change the direction of your work. Um, and the card that Alan Moore likes, always likes quoting is, uh, What wouldn't you do? <laughs> And that's that's a great one. It's that kind of you look at yourself and you go, and it's like okay, that's a and it may not be a way to like keep an audience, but it's certainly a way for you to stay fresh as a creator. So that kind of if you're known for like incredibly ponderous books about death, maybe it's the time for you to do the lightweight slapstick comedy, you know. Um, and you know you try to keep your relationship with your creativity a lot. I mean, live. That's one of the weird things. There's this. Um, actually, I'm going to talk about Alan Moore some more. It's like he did the. The Avatar collected them, but a series of essays circa 1985, just before he did Watchmen. Yeah. Uh, and these four essays, and they're good. They're good animal essays circa 1985. And then he writes an epilogue. And this is about 2006 or so, I reckon, about that time. Mm-hmm. Um, and the essay is him, of course, in the present day, talking about how he feels about these essays now. And he's cutting, and he's, A, his voice is better. His voice is stronger now. He's more sure of it it seems very like more casual but at the same time he's saying yeah it's a pretty good lesson for somebody who's breaking in and etc like however <laughs> these are not the le- these are not lessons that any once you've passed any point of a creator the question is not like how do you make a panel work the question is how on earth can you keep yourself interested <laughs> you know and um and it's, and it's talking about like when you are making things even more difficult for yourself as a creator and a lot of i mean and trust i was read that and i was like that's an interesting thing to think about. It's not necessarily, I mean, I've been doing comics, as you said, we, 
we first met 14 years ago. I've been doing 14 years. That's a long time now. Um, and the thing becomes like, okay, what, what, why are you still doing it? What have you got to say? Because I was always, you know, there's some people who just like telling stories, which I also clearly like telling stories. But for me, there's got to be something else as well. You know, and there's certain things I can do, um, or I, have, I think I've proved I can do quite reliably. And then it always is like, make it harder for yourself. Make it harder. And like, but a book like Die uh, over at Image is that's make it harder in one way, in that I've, it's so incredibly intensely researched. It's so much bigger than the page. I've written an entire RPG system off the side. You know, it's ludicrously dense. And once the future is the other way of doing it, as in, okay, let's do it like the ABC comics more did. Like, the, let's make this very light. I mean, you know, it's still researched and it's still about stuff and it's still heavy, but let's make it improvisational. Let's leave a lot of room for the artist to play. Let's um, make it harder for you, you know, as in like, leave, it, leave bigger gaps and trust your instincts as a storyteller. And like, see if you can get an energy that way. And it's like, for me, it's, um, if I get to do both these books at once, it's kind of, um, I feel incredibly lucky, you know what I mean? Like, I get to try these different parts of, I, I think, did I say the word muse earlier? I might have said, oh, I'm sorry. But let me say it again. It's just ways to sort of dance with the muse and genuinely um, have fun there. I mean, that's what it is. I, I look at my last two years of my life in terms of the work. Like, and I, I feel like, oh, yeah, things basically, I was doing what I wanted to do. And how few creators get to say that. You know, I want to shoot myself. It's, it's awful. <sighs> so you're talking about what uh, wouldn't you do? And you say, like, you don't feel you're ready to do that crime comic. Should we put you on the spot, like, right now to, to do that <laughs> comic? Like, are you... Like, is it just a matter of someone calling and, and offering someone the level of Dan Mora, but some someone that this might be good for, for like, just to kind of drop in your lap? Like, with something yeah. like that, uh, get, uh, get you going? It's like, basically, I need to basically take, steal Sean away from Ed. <laughs> yeah, steal Sean away from Ed, and then I'll do a crime comic. I was thinking Sean, but I didn't want to speak his name like for fear of, of 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 calling him forth but you just did it so <laughs> no i love that so have, have you read um talk about your books have you read uh i'm not sure if the view copies have gone out yet of pulp no not yet. oh it's so good like um i've, I've got is the advanced it's an advanced pdf so it's just obviously like in turn ed must have given it me um and it's really good it's like i mean i think their last few the last few years them have been especially strong i mean ed and short of never doing anything but eyes and winning um, but Pulp is really interesting in terms of it's a crime story set in the 1930s, but it's not really, it's about the 1930s, but at the same time, it's also about the pulp era, the earlier Pulp eras. Um, and it tells a really mature, con, uh, constrained story that still like seems personal as well. So like, honestly, uh, I, I was blown away by it. I'll, uh, um, I'm interject for the people f following. We're talking about Sean Phillips and Ed. Oh, sorry. Ed uh, Brew, uh, Brewbaker here. So someone's probably going to spit out a website article about this, about how Kieran wants to do a crime comic, but only with Sean Phillips. <laughs> no, <laughs> also, Ed to book a, like the, uh, to leave his social uh, distancing and, and come, be, come to the UK and uh, rough up Kieran. Like, we'll see. We'll see. So the real reason why I don't think I would do it, I think the thing that scared me of doing a 1950s crime comic is the amount of research. Because, like, I mean, is, I, I, someone sent me, the last time I did an interview was Anthony Johnson's podcast with Ryan's, and he said to me, Kieran, you, you may know you have a reputation. And I was like, what do you, what's he going to say? <laughs> you have a reputation, you do more research than anyone else. And I'm like, really? No, I don't. And it's like, <laughs> you know, that was an enormous compliment. But, like, I, I sort of been thinking about that since I do take the research quite seriously. It would bug me if I kind of did a 1950s British crime comic without making it authentic. Um, so that bugs me. Uh, so I knew it's a matter of work which scares me, and it scares me more than it, for example, the Spartans did. Because Spart, I'm not, I'm not having an ancient Spartan turn up and tell me that was wrong, <laughs> you know. But the second thing that bugs me is that I'm such a nice, sweet boy. You know what I mean? It's like, um, <laughs> it's like I, I, I'm not a low life. I'm, I'm not, you know. Are you really going to believe me writing about the seedy side of the underbelly of London? <laughs> and that's the other reason why I haven't done crime. I can, imagine my do I can imagine myself doing it. This is actually the thing. I had the idea for a crime comic, and it eventually became a fancy comic about trial by combat. You know, that's something I'm like, you know what I mean? Like, that's that really good example of, I start with, okay, I want to do a story about a lawyer, because I really like lawyers, like, as a, as a concept, not as a 
Okay, I don't object to lawyers as people, but like, there's, there's so much in a court and arguing. This, I really like that. I, sit, I can sit and watch a good lawyer, you know, show or TV all day. Um, so how can I do a lawyer show? But immediately it becomes a fantasy comic. You know what I mean? That, that's what I mean. Isn't I always get mugged by the fantasy writer. Yes, like we'll uh, conceive a drinking game now of a uh, read a Karen Gillan comic, and 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 then when the wizard shows up, no matter what comic it is, take a drink. <laughs> Maybe I should start by writing a wizard comic, and then actually, if it starts with wizards in it, the wizards will dis- the wizards will somehow leave the comic, and I'll yeah. be left with some story about sad academics. Oh, uh, I'm looking at you saying that just as you received your uh, honorary uh, doctorate <laughs> earlier. So, um, so we are going to turn to talk about kind of the present situation without getting too much on a kind of downer. Like, uh, you, you are a freelance, uh, writer. I, like, I, like, uh, I assume you're somewhat, uh, uh, used to working in solitude, but what's it been like for you? It's been hard. I mean, like what I sell to everybody is, uh, we are playing this one on easy mode, relatively speaking. Mm-hmm. You know, I, um, I already work from home. Uh, so I'm, I'm working not in an ISO way. The place I'm working for are still receptive work, so I'm still working my projects. Um, I have no dependents, so like, I, don't, I don't have kids. Uh, so I, you know, I've got an old, I haven't got older relatives I'm looking after immediately. Uh, uh, I'm with my wife, so I'm not lonely. And I, me and Chrissy don't hate each other. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, that is as far as I, and also there's no, we don't have an immediate worry about the money. Um, so that's kind of like, with that's as easy as it gets really and even so it's like obviously the, the real stress is everything else in that, that how much is bothering else what can you do to help the community what can um my 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 other friends and relatives are in a worse situation or are more isolated um that's the thing that really kind of gets you i mean like and the, and the, um obviously not on the personal the weird boredom of it times um and it, there's been on the other side is there's been so much um Actually, I wrote about, I write a newsletter and I wrote about it in my latest newsletter. I, I did a, I actually took quite a while to work out what to say because I think so much as you sort of see people on Twitter getting a little bit tetchy with each other more. Mm-hmm. I'm aware that, okay, no, we need to be, we, we need to be gentler. So I'm actually thinking quite hard about what I can say, which is positive and useful to people, not just kind of like the blankly saccharine stuff, but the kind of like, okay, what might be useful to people? Like what brings people together? And like, I've started, um, into, into my small social group. We've been doing things like we set up, I've set up the Friday night drinks, like comic creators in a, you know, so we get, you know, we get into the video stream and we hang out, we play uh, various PC games in the window. It wasn't the board game stuff, shared screen. Um, you know what I mean? I and mean, that's like a small, and that's the stuff which is heartwarming is the wrong thing, but the resilience of people and how people are trying to help each other and form groups. I mean, there's all the, I mean, talking about the sharp end, my wife's a ta- half Italian. So we've had, you know, we have relatives over there and we have a lot of information coming back from that. At the same time, some of how society is ordered to actually run in isolation and help each other and food dropping off to each other and all that kind of way people have come together, even despite being very apart. I mean, like, that's the kind of stuff you can look at. But at the same time, this is enormous. Like, you know, um, it's very difficult to look at this and have true perspective at that moment in time. What about you, Chris? How are you feeling? Um, I too work from home, so like I am fairly um, insulated from this. I, but I see a lot of bad things happening. But I'm I, like I don't know how to say this, so I'll probably butcher it. But I kind of like the idea that we're at least we're all going through it together, and it's not just uh, the poor or uh, other countries that are far what, like away from uh, ours. That we're at least we're. It kind of builds in a deeper sense of compassion. I, th- like I think that we're all going through it, like even though some of us are more sheltered to it or just uh, more uh, privileged from the starting mm-hmm. point, I think that's going to be kind of helpful. Like going back to what you said about um, 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 the fog, like previously, we may have not have been able to muster up the, I don't know if courage is, is the right word to do something to prevent this kind of thing before, but maybe this will change things for the... Mm-hmm. I mean, as you say, it's like, um, this is a big, this is a genuine shared social moment. And like, that's a, that's a cold way of putting it, but it's like anyone alive today and sentient and thinking will be able to talk about this time and how we felt. And that's kind of like, 
and the flattening of that, that as you say, the, the flat, how despite the, the individual experiences are very, very different in lots of different ways. Um, the, um, you know, the, there is a, a base level of understanding of what it would be, what it would be like. Uh, and that, that, that can't help but bring people together is the hope. I mean, uh, part of me feels bad to even look for the silver, no, silver lining is the wrong word, but look for like positive strands, but mm -hmm. big, big things that shape the entire world do change things because I mean, if you, there's stuff, there's policies being put forward now by governments at the moment, which would be unimaginable a month ago. You know what I mean? Like something, something is impossible until we decide it's not. Uh, so we'll see where it goes. It also kind of puts pause on some things that when it, when there is the kind of headspace to revisit certain topics by, I don't know, uh, politicians, the real world people, they, they may be in a different mindset so maybe this will have helped but yeah i must say it's interesting because it's like I, so on a, on a really from the less away from the heavy stuff talking to creatives it's this kind of anyone who is writing a story let's say in the present day is going swearing because they've got to, like how on earth do they do it i mean i'm doing this book called die and the plot of die is these people being dragged into a role-playing game as 40 year olds and you know imagine if they ever get back to earth it's like they'll have missed this <laughs> you know yeah. and that's weird uh and like imagine them coming back and go what the f i'm glad i was stuck in a weird monstrous fantasy world rather than that yeah. so, so it's kind of a last question how do you as a fiction writer um deal with um this kind of thing is 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 a pandemic or something kind of off off like, like is that taboo for a while in, in fiction or kind of how do you like even begin to i don't know either write about it or not uh write about it is 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 the wound too fresh because like we don't even know like how serious the wound is really but uh, what i would inevitably do is i would stick a wizard in it um what i would actually do you, you write those like the genuine when stuff is happening it's not even the wound being too fresh it's also like i the i have no idea what's going on and especially if you're writing something a bit pulpy it does feel um there's certain imagery at the moment i would probably avoid but at the same time, that's only because of the books I'm writing, you know? Like, I would be, it'd be more likely I would touch on something a lot in, about the pandemic in Die than I would in uh, What's the Future. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard. I must admit, it's like, because um, it's one of the things, like, it's such a big thing that, um, that it warps everything. I mean, I always like, one of the examples I always talk about is um, uh, Jane Austen. Jane Austen was all, all the Jane Austen novels take place during the Napoleonic Wars. So like all those stories, the soldiers come in looking fancy and heading off the battle and it's, it's all there. So yeah. Jane Austen is a war novel, <laughs> but it's like, but it's just the backdrop in the same way that any big historical event is just the backdrop to literary fiction or backdrop to whatever genre you're in. Um, and occasionally it's more forefronted, like, or occasionally it's less forefront. Okay, like it's like War and Peace versus Jane Austen. Sometimes it's more clearly about the period, and sometimes it's more about the people living in the period. Uh, and so I imagine some of that thinking is going to come through. I'm, I'm just, I imagine a lot of fiction, it, like, a lot of people have like, been saying, is like, so we're going to watch a load of bottle episodes on Monday night, me and my friends. Like the idea, you know, the, sort of the bottle episode appears to be less a thing to save budgets and more kind of like a real way of life. Um, yeah, I know. This is one of the things. Like, I expect you always see. Like, okay, how can I talk about these feelings without just doing a story about the pandemic? Mm -hmm. Like, and there'll be a lot of that, and there'll be a lot of like pro probably thinly veiled metaphors people will be using. Um, but I think that at the same time, people be imagined like there's a quote I put in the last newsletter from Tolkien, um, and it's the quote about the, the joys of escapism. An escape, and escape, or rather, in defense of escapism. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm not going to re try to memorize the quote because I don't, I haven't got it memorized. <laughs> but it's basically people who are critiquing escapism are, are genuinely confusing the flight of a deserter for the escape of the, sorry, they're confusing the, the flight of a deserter for the escape of a prisoner. As in, like, somebody who is actually on the front lines and running away from battle is not the same thing as somebody who's been put in prison and wishes not to be in prison. Yeah. And at the moment, like, all, you know, in some degree, almost all of us are confined to some degree physically. And at the times of this, escapism becomes more important than ever. Like, you know, 
the, like, many people like, well, if we've had fantasies in the last week and a half of like oh imagine like you know going down the pub with a few of my mates or um, playing a game of football or just having a dance party these things might as well be dragons at the moment you know and so the, the value of just pure escapism rather than something specifically about it I think like there's going to be lots of works of escape, of pure escapism born of this period too, of just sitting here and wishing that you could be outside, <laughs> you know? And I, I laugh and I'm not, I'm not joking, you know? You'll be like, I'm sick, you know? Yeah, so like, it'll be interesting. Because it'll be, it's such, because one of the things, we, comics are for everybody. Like we said, like, create, different creators come to the work with their own perspective and create something uniquely theirs. One of the weird things about big, big social events well, people's individual perspectives are still unique, the fact everyone is experiencing something gives a basic level of understanding. So in other words, there will be, de- just because there's that base thing that's happened to everyone simultaneously, there'll be more fiction coming from that place, uh, which will be interesting. Okay, um, uh, that kind of uh, wraps us up today. Uh, thank you for uh, coming and uh, joining us. I, like, I do want to plug your Twitter. It's uh, Kieran uh, Gillen, just like it is on the slide we have. And there's a link to your word mail newsletter at the top of your uh, Twitter page. Is there anywhere else that uh, people can find you online? That's, that's probably the best. I've got a Tumblr, which is also Kieran Gillen, but my Twitter which is mainly just me tweeting music or pictures of miniatures or like um, really bad jokes. Um, my newsletter is the best way to actually get, in terms of my pretentious ramblings, uh, that comes out every week or two. Uh, that's Kieran Gillen at substack.com. But as Chris noted, is linked at the top of the blog. Sorry, top of the Twitter. Yeah. And make sure to ask him on Twitter his thoughts about Kula Shaker. Like, uh, <laughs> like I really love to see Kieran write much more about Kula Shaker. But that's it. Thank you for coming, and I hope to talk to you again. No, it's been a joy. Thank you for having me.